All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our session entitled De-Escalation of Care, Changing Times. I'm David Miller. I'm an adult provider uh, from Arizona, from Tucson, the University of Arizona. And with my co-chair, Cynthia Brown, we are very excited for the speakers that we have today. Um, I think it sort of goes without saying that whether we advise our patients or not, they are self-de-escalating. Um, and so it's very important for us to do this in a organized and ideally evidence-based fashion. And so that's what uh, our speakers will be addressing today. So I will turn it over to Cynthia to introduce our first speaker. In many respects, I think our first speaker needs no introduction. We all know Dr. Nicole Hamblett Mayer. She is a professor of pediatrics and adjunct professor of biostatistics at the University of Washington and co-executive director of the CF Therapeutic Development Network. She, uh, you probably remember her from the plenary stage last year and uh, has been co-leading the Simplify study. And she's here today to present to us on uh, the results of, of individuals who uh, stopped both hypertonic saline and Dornase Alpha in the Simplify study. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. It's, and um, welcome everybody who's joining online. Let's see, get oriented here. Here are my disclosures, and I have to say, I've never been so excited to get back to Seattle in some humidity <laughs> after a few days. <laughs> Absolutely. Understanding whether daily therapies can be used less often without sacrificing health improvements gained with highly effective modulator therapy remains a high priority across our entire community. Emerging data suggests that people with CF are in fact discontinuing therapy after Lexicaftor, Tezicaftor, Ivacaftor, or ETI. And initial results that were presented this summer uh, from the HERO2 study reports that nearly 41% of a large cohort of over 800 participants reported discontinuing at least one chronic daily therapy, and 65% of these stopped more than one therapy. And I'd like to highlight Dr. Hergenroder will be updating these results in this session today. Despite this, there remains limited data on the impact of treatment discontinuation. The Simplify study was the first study to evaluate the impact of discontinuing therapy after establishment of highly effective modulators. The trials enrolled participants 12 years and older established on ETI and taking hypertonic saline and or Dornase Alpha. Participants randomized in the trials uh, were randomized to continue or discontinue therapy for six weeks. The primary hypothesis in each trial was that discontinuing therapy is not inferior to to continuing therapy as measured by the six-week change in FEV1. Trial, uh, trials found no meaningful changes in lung function or other key clinical outcomes with singular withdrawal of either hypertonic saline or Dornase Alpha. Now, an exploratory endpoint we did not show was to evaluate the CFQR treatment burden score, which was uh, consisted of three scaled questions for which an increase in score uh, represents decreasing treatment burden. And we did find a suggestion towards de decreased treatment burden in each trial with slightly more exhibited in the hypertonic saline trial as compared to the Dornase Alpha trial, which fits with um, uh, the application of these therapies. Now there are of course additional P important key questions that still remain. Uh, simplify evaluated outcomes over a six week withdrawal of single therapy. So of course, what is the impact on longer term withdrawal? Um, this is of course being addressed by ongoing studies including HERO2 and CF Storm that we'll be hearing about in this session. And secondly, what is the impact of withdrawal of both therapies? Well, interestingly, the design of Simplify allows us to begin to evaluate this question. Participants on both hypertonic saline and Dornase Alpha were first randomized to one of the two trials and then subsequently allowed to enroll in the second trial pending eligibility. So key ancillary, ancillary objective of our study was to evaluate um, among the subset participating in both trials, evaluate the impact of discontinuing both hypertonic saline and Dornase Alpha by the end of Simplify completion as compared to continuing both therapies. 
So this is, of course, the most extreme comparison enabled by the study design. And we did do, we'll show you, sensitivity analyses that included the cohort who remained on at least one therapy over the duration of Simplify. Our hypothesis uh, was that discontinuing both therapies sequentially uh, is comparable to remaining on both therapies with respect to the change in FEV1 and other key outcomes from the beginning to the end of Simplify. Secondly, we hypothesize that discontinuing both therapies is associated with significant treatment burden reduction as compared to remaining on both therapies. We use multivariable regression models uh, to estimate treatment effects adjusted for time between trials, trial order, age, sex at birth, and baseline FEV percent predicted. There were 436 participants who were on both hypertonic saline and Dornase Alpha that completed a trial in Simplify. Among these, um, there were 254 participants who enrolled in both trials and 182 participants who participated in only one trial. So comparing these two populations uh, at baseline, uh, their baseline characteristics at the beginning of the first trial were fairly comparable. Now we can compare characteristics at the end of the first trial when maybe that choice of whether or not to participate in the second uh, trial was made. Um, what we found was that there was a slightly greater average decline in FEV1 among those participating in only one trial. However, this was not associated with treatment continuation uh, in the trial. The median time between uh, trials was zero day days as a majority of participants actually immediately screened for the second trial and the distribution of time between trials was similar across all arms. Um, and then in total, the median time from the beginning of the first trial to the end of the second trial was three and a half months or 15 weeks. So we're beginning to get some data on this cohort of um, uh, you know, what happens when you discontinue therapy for um, approximately 15 weeks, which we will show. So through randomization, about half of these participants were randomized to continue therapy in the first trial. Uh, all of these stayed on therapy or were immediately rolled in the second trial. Um, and then through randomization, uh, random, uh, about half were randomized to continue therapy in the second trial. So this forms our first analysis cohort of those who remained on both hypertonic saline and Dornase Alpha over the duration of Simplify participation. About half were randomized to discontinue therapy in the first trial. Um, and about two thirds of these remained off therapy between trials and about one third uh, actually restarted trial therapy um, between trials. And this actually, this cohort forms our first sensitivity analysis cohort that we'll be showing results on throughout. Uh, through randomization, about half of these were randomized to also discontinue therapy in the second trial. And so this forms our second analysis uh, cohort of those who went off both therapies by the end of Simplify participation. So our main analysis cohorts compared those who remain on uh, both hypertonic saline and Dornase over the duration of Simplify versus those who went off both therapies by the end of Simplify. And through randomization, there's one more cohort here that we don't want to miss, and those who um, remained on at least one therapy over the course of Simplify. So everybody is accounted here um, and that we'll be presenting results on. So for our main analysis cohorts, comparing those um, at baseline uh, between those who uh, were on both versus off both, uh, the baseline characteristics were comparable between these two groups. Um, and adherence uh, to the treatment regimen uh, was high and similar across both on and off groups. And treatment regimen here represents, you know, what they were assigned to do um, per protocol uh, throughout the study in terms of their randomization assignment, whether they were randomized to remain on therapy or, or go off of therapy. Here is the results for the change in FEV percent predicted in those two groups. So of course, they're, um, along with the main Simplify uh, study results, they had a very uh, relatively high baseline lung function. For those who remained off both therapies, the overall mean change was minus 0.34%. 
and those who remained on both therapy was minus 0.57%. So um, just to note, all of our scales here are not to zero, so um, in order to really kind of show, uh, show the data here. So the adjusted mean difference was 0.22% uh, with a 95% confidence interval from minus 1.6 to 2.0. And just of note that this does exclude the predefined non-inferiority margin that we used for the original simplified trial of minus 3%. Here is the data for the change in the CFQR treatment burden domain. So, you know, we've lost some elements of randomization through this design. So there is some baseline differences um, that we see, although not statistically significant. But what is interesting here is that those who remained on both, uh, their data remains fairly stable. But there was uh, a, a decreased treatment burden among those who went off both therapy. And the adjusted mean difference between both groups was eight points. Um, so we don't actually know what the MCID is for this subdomain. This is an exploratory look by taking this one component out of the CFQR, so we need to be fairly cautious. But what is interesting is that um, magnitude-wise, this is more than, more than double the, what we saw in a single trial. Um, there was not uh, much difference in the CFQR respiratory domain. Confidence intervals here rule out what we would consider to be clinically meaningful, as well as with the, uh, the CRIS, nothing um, very different here as well. Lung clearance index um, was only done in a sub-study within Simplify, and so we only had 12 and 14 participants in each group um, for which we had this in, this, uh, in these sub-cohorts, but this is an important, more objective um, measure that we can look at. So for those who went off both therapies, the overall mean change was minus 0.19, and those who stayed on therapies, it was 0 0.1. So the adjusted mean difference was minus 0.2. So remember with LCI, um, negative uh, you know, decreases mean um, you know, improvement. This is not ne this is necessarily clinically meaningful or clinically important. Uh, the confidence intervals do rule out what we be what we consider to be um, perhaps the minimal clinically important effect um, in terms of harm if we were to benchmark that versus a value of 0.5 like we did for the main study. Overall safety data, um, there is perhaps you know a slightly high, higher increase of respiratory adverse events, but the overall absolute uh, rate of adverse events were very low in this cohort. The two serious adverse events overlap with the hospitalizations and they were non-respiratory uh, related. So let's go to those sensitivity analyses. So here are uh, the baseline characteristics, or actually all of the characteristics for those who discontinued therapy um, but restarted therapy between trials. Um, we did not note actually many uh, differences between uh, these two groups. And perhaps the main difference here, maybe there was a slightly um, higher FEV in those who did not restart between trials. And while the uh, their rates of uh, PA positivity were the same, there was slightly higher use of chronic oral antibiotics, probably azithromycin, in those who restarted. And here's what happened uh, to that group. So again, these are you know fairly high, um, uh, fairly small changes here. But the mean change in FEV one percent predicted from uh, the start to the end was minus 0.08%. Um, so this group, uh, while that choice was made, they did not um, necessarily you know there was nothing of uh, significance that happened with this group. And then here's that last cohort um, who remained on at least one therapy uh, throughout the duration of Simplify through uh, randomization. Uh, baseline characteristics I do not display, but they were um, comparable to all of the other groups. So whereas the on group had a mean change of minus 0.57%, um, the off group minus 3.34%, um, the at least one therapy group had a minus 0.75% change. So really, uh, these groups are all fairly comparable. So in summary, Simplify allowed for the evaluation of outcomes after sequential discontinuation of hypertonic saline and door nasalpha. 
The eligibility for primary comparison of interest was conditional on decisions to enroll in both trials and maintain consistent therapy between them. Among the cohort remaining on both therapies over the course of Simplify versus those who discontinued both therapies by the end of Simplify, sequentially discontinuing both therapies was non-inferior to continuing both according to the predefined Simplify non-inferiority margin for FEV1. Treatment burden uh, significantly lowered in those who discontinued both therapies, although uh, cautiously the MCID remains unclear in the context um, of noted baseline differences um, however, and we do see this as an opportunity to link uh, for future research with our partner study, Quest, who did qualitative interviews um, to further understand uh, this measure. No meaningful differences between those remaining on versus off therapy were found in LCI, PROs, or safety outcomes. And um, remember, now we have some longer term data, um, at least you know, for about three and a half weeks, where we see sustained stability and outcome measures observed in the cohort dis who discontinued both therapies. Whoops. There we go. And sensitivity analyses demonstrated results from those excluded from the main analyses were comparable. So in conclusion, Simplify offers the first estimates of changes in outcomes after discontinuation of both hypertonic saline and Dornase alpha among those with well-preserved lung function after establishment of ETI. The lung function um, in our cohort was high at baseline. These results must be cautiously interpreted given the conditional nature of inclusion into the analysis cohorts and relatively short duration of follow-up. And we will be looking towards ongoing studies um, that will be critical to understand the longer term outcomes associated with discontinuation of both hypertonic saline and Dornase alpha to help us inform clinical care, including CF Storm and HERO2 that you will be hearing more about today. So I'd just like to end by acknowledging the simplified trial participants, sites, and research teams, um, our statisticians in particular, Renee Russell and Mark Klosser, my co-PIs, Alex Gifford and David Nichols, and our um, co great co-author team. So thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, we'll open for questions. Does anyone have any questions at the moment? So um, just from my standpoint, Nicole, just wondering, is, is there any plans with this cohort to continue to follow function longer term in the registry? Yes, we've collected the registry di uh, ID um, for everyone, and so we do have that, well, we will have that long-term follow-up data. And we did um, also, um, Dr. Gifford uh, has already presented some initial data on, we've collected 24 uh, data up to 24 weeks on their some of their treatment patterns, and so that data will be coming out as as well. Okay. Uh, okay. So, question on the chat. Fantastic study. So, did they continue on their vest during the study? That's the first question. And then, second part: In your clinical practice, do you plan to re-add either hypertonic or Dornase during exacerbations for these patients <laughs> who can remain off daily therapy? A great question. So let me tackle the first. Um, so uh, that adherence, going back to that adherence data, so per protocol, uh, we required people to maintain their other maintenance uh, therapeutic approaches. That was including airway, airway clearance therapy. So they actually, we used an electronic uh, daily diary where they were asked to record uh, their compliance with use of their other medication, uh, their protocolized medications, including whether they took or did not take uh, hypertonic saline, Dornase Alpha, and their compliance with airway clearance as compared to what they were doing at baseline. And so that's how we measured adherence. Um, we have supportive data from the Quest study, which indicates uh, that you know we have every hope to believe that um, they were doing, especially within the six-week study, maintaining that throughout uh, that short duration of period. There's always the potential, um, especially seeing that treatment burden, uh, you know, increase. That maybe there was some um, decrease in that, especially in the off treatment, um, the off. Um, treatment arm, but I, I think even so, um, if they were compliant, then you know 
nothing really, you know, we didn't see uh, much difference in FEV, at least um, even if there wasn't full compliance with airway clearance therapy. With regards to the second question, I may have to defer to my clinical colleagues. Um, I have to say I'm a statistician, uh, so I, I wouldn't be able to talk about what I do in my clinical practice. Um, but I do think, um, you know, we need to be cautious with these results as they are presented. Um, they do have limitations. This is a, you know, a um, uh, really specific cohort. Um, we'll also refer you to, and these data will be coming out shortly. Uh, they just got accepted for publication. They were presented at the European CF meetings, um, recognizing that not everybody saw these. But we did have data from the Simplify study for the lower lung function cohort um, among those who were 40 to 60 percent uh, predicted. And unfortunately, we're not able to enroll as many as we hoped in that cohort um, because they were hard to find. Um, or they may have already discontinued therapy. Um, but in that cohort, I'll just give you a preview that um, that those who discontinued therapy remained fairly stable, um, just as we had seen uh, in these data. And uh, sorry, this was just for hypertonic saline. So the lower lung function cohort was just uh, for discontinuation of hypertonic saline. Those who remained on therapy had a slight increase, um, like 1.8%. Um, of course, these were not statistically significant. Um, so we'll discuss that in the paper. The adverse event, events were um, very clean in that cohort, which was very comforting. Um, but those data should be um, published um, out soon. So. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as a as a clinician to follow up asking the question, I think we often ask our patients to per pick things up during exacerbations, whether it's Dornase or hypertonic saline. And, you know, there is a field now in the registry for PRN use of these medications. So I would encourage you, to, you know, as we, we rely a lot on the registry and the importance that we put data that reflect what our patients are doing. So if you please utilize that field because we can look retrospectively through the registry at some of these uh, questions as well. Awesome. And one, one last question here. Uh, do you have imaging data in the study group? And do you see differences in this, if so, after stopping therapy? Yeah. No, we did not have, um, collect imaging data in this study. Awesome. Well, thank you. Okay. <laughs> We'd next like to invite Tracy Daniels up to the podium. Tracy joins us from the uh, from the UK. We are not the only ones uh, grappling with what to do when our patients um, de-escalate their care. Uh, Tracy is a clinical lead for cystic fibrosis and a research fellow at York and Scor Scarborough Teaching Hospital. Thank you. Um, I'm blinded in the lights here um, and also can only just see over. So, um, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll get on OK. I'll just stand slightly to the side. So thank you for the introduction um, and thank you for asking me to come speak about this data. Um, these are my disclosures and I'll just work out how to move on. <laughs> Neither of us can move it on. Amazing. Lovely. So I'm going to talk about the impact of in-health therapy on FEV1 in people taking ETI. Um, and I'm presenting this on behalf of a, a big community of people who are part of the CF Health Hub Learning Health System, which I'll talk about within, within this talk. <laughs> I'm doing really well so far. <laughs> Get to see all my slides at once. Yeah. Oh no, it's okay, you do what I do. <laughs> Lovely. I need to do the thing where I just say next slide, please, and let you do it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. So um so just first of all, I just want to set a little bit of background as to where our research group has been thinking in terms of the design of this study and, um, and our thinking about in-health therapy and, and its potential need within kind of this modulator era. And I'm going to refer back to the Ivor Kafta data and really think about the clinical trial data versus the real world data. 
Um, and the great news, as we all know from, um, from the Macomb data and other data, is that actually when taken within clinical trial situations and open label studies, the effects of, eat, of, um, of modulators um, persist over a long period of time with really stable lung function. However, the real world data that's been published and this systematic review by Jamie Duckers in 2021 um, demonstrated this kind of tailing off of lung function back to baseline by year five. Um, and she tries to move the slide on again. It's just not going. Um, and this is demonstrated really um, clearly just in the Manchester data from the UK, where you can see that FEV1 was back to baseline by year five. Going back to the systematic review, I guess for us what we were thinking was, well, what is going on here? And that systematic review also had a really nice graph showing alongside that the, um, the BMI was continuing to increase over five years. So. There's that feeling that the, um, the modulators are still having an effect, but perhaps less of an effect in real world on lung um, health. David, I'm just going to get you to do it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, um, so alongside this, we were thinking about some of the great data that was published from registry data. So this is UK registry data that demonstrated that inhaled therapy in the form of inhaled antibiotics, Dornase alpha and hypertonic, decreased post initiation or post um, commissioning or reimbursement of Ivacafta. So what you can see here on the left side of each graph is the pre Ivacafta era and on the right side of each graph, the post Ivacafta era with the top line being those that were ineligible for, for the modulator and the bottom ones eligible. So we see this drop off of prescribed treatment in those who were eligible for Ivacafta. And we see this as well with ETI. So this data just demonstrates this time with NPR data, so prescription data, collection of prescription data, that we see that drop off again post ETI. So less in health therapy picked up and presumably less in health therapy taken as well. So this kind of really sort of challenged us to start to think about, well, in health therapy, does this have a place in terms of that difference between the real world data and the clinical data? And other groups obviously are really interested in this as well. And we've heard from Simplify um, and we'll be hearing from Hero2 within this study. CF Storm has been referenced throughout the conference as well. And I'm going to talk about Nemo today. We've got um, Nemo and Hero2 sitting as observational studies and then CF Storm and Simplify as, as the withdrawal RCTs. So we're getting a real wealth of different types of data to really think about this problem. So what's different, where, where is the place of Nemo is, is kind of, I guess, what I'll be describing here. Um, and we'll go over kind of what it does, but essentially it's a five-year study, so longer in length than some of the other studies. Um, it is observational, so it's going to give a different sort of data to the others, um, but also it, it uses people's own choices about what they've decided to do with their treatment to continue, drop it or not take it at all. And through electronic monitoring, we can group those people so that we, um, we can access those that have got a wide range of lung function. So as Nicole mentioned in answer to the question, where there have been challenges around recruiting maybe lower lung function, people with lower lung function who have perhaps made their choices very firmly about continuing or discontinuing, we can include their data within, within our study. It's not just me. Um, so, so I'm going to talk about NEMO, which is the National Efficacy Effectiveness CFTR Modulator Optimization Programme, very long title, and you can flick over, thank you. Um, and, and this is the crux, really, of the ethos of the study. Um, I'm a clinician, I'm a physio, and as people come to me in clinic, I've heard this a lot over the last few years. You know, I've decided, Tracy, I'm going to stop my treatment. I'm not doing it now, but what's going to happen? 
conversely, I've got other people who are like, do you know what, I really, I don't like my treatment. We all know in health therapy can be a, a hassle. It's not well liked, but what's going to happen if I carry on with it? Is it worth it? Or am I just slogging away for something that maybe isn't worthwhile? So these people who've made their choices, what we're hoping is that by using their electronic data capture, it's very passive, they're not having to do anything, but those choices that they've made, they can contribute data so that we can understand and answer these questions. So the design of NEMO, as I've mentioned, is an observational cohort study. This is across 15 UK adult CF centres, um, and these are people over the age of 16. They're prescribed in health therapy, and they have more than one FEV1 reading um, annually. And actually, what the data is showing us is we have, for the vast majority of people, over three FEV1 readings. Um, there's ongoing recruitment into the CF Health Hub Learning Health System, and they study nests within that. And there's five year follow up with currently we're into year two. So for those who haven't come across it, the CF Health Hub Learning Health System is um, essentially um, where people at home have got chip nebulizers. These have been in place upwards of five years for many people, but people are still coming into the program. It's around about 1,400 people, and that data is available via a web or a mobile app to be able to see the data. I think the important thing here, because at least someone in the room will be thinking, oh, big brother. Um, and it's definitely a question that I always get. Um, and I think what's really important here is the ethos of the programme, which is this is data that belongs to the patient. The person with CF has this data and has access to it. They then choose whether they want to share that with their clinical team. And they can also choose whether they want to share that pseudo anonymously with researchers like me. So as a clinician, I use this. Um, my patients choose whether to share and as a researcher as well. And that can be toggled so people can choose at any time. Um, and I think this is a really important thing about data. You know, we, we really want it to be a mirror so we can hold it up to people. Kind of, they can see themselves. They can get up in the morning, they can look in the mirror, see what they've been managing. I don't know about you, but I can't remember what I ate three days ago. So how to remember whether you've taken all your treatment or not is probably quite challenging. And certainly some data that I did previously say is it's really pretty challenging. And then if they choose to want to have a handhold to really think about what that mirror looks like and what they might be able to change within it, then they can kind of share that data with a clinician. And this is what it looks like. So it's co-produced digital platform. Green bars are, you've done all your prescribed treatments today. Orange, some of it. White, none of it. Okay. And the methodology. So the exposure within this study is adherence to in-health therapy. That's classed as high adherence, over 75% adherent, or low adherence, under 75%. We use a cluster model that's been published by our group previously, so we cluster into four clusters of adherence and combine the lower three. The outcome is annual percent predicted FUV1 trend over five years, and it's multi-level modelling that's used. And we're aiming really to really think about what could the effects of co-adherence to in-health therapy be on FEV1 decline and what do the changes look like? And this is all with objective data. So what does it, it really look like when we're not relying on any sort of recall or any sort of, you know, kind of want to kind of portray in a, in a particular way or remember or misremember? So this just allows that, that kind of objective way of looking at it. It is, though, really important that I just highlight that this is preliminary data, so we're still cleaning NPR data, and that has not yet been adjusted for within the model. Um, and also, obviously, it's observational data. So some of the baseline demographics. Firstly, I guess, just to say we've got 900 people in our low adherence group or lower adherence group. And we've got 143 people in our high adherence. As a clinician, I had a slight concern actually at one point whether we would have sufficient people in the high adherence group. Um, but as it turns out, um, actually people have chosen that as, you know, in, a, in enough numbers that it looks really helpful for the research. And the other thing that 
was slightly um, surprising in a good way is that they're pretty evenly matched for lung function. And as, as discussed, really, um, we're really seeing some of those lower lung function people within this group. Um, so that's, that's really helpful. Um, as you might expect, the high adherent group are a little bit older, which ties in with the published research. So this graph is really just to very much highlight that these are two very different groups. Um, we've got a high adherent group, which sit at around 90% adherence. And I guess the other interesting thing about them is that that adherence is pretty static over the two years. Conversely, for our low adherence or lower adherence group, uh, they start at around 30% adherence and drop over time down to 20% adherence. Um, and in year one, what we saw was that absolutely these two groups overlap. There is no difference between their lung function, um, whether they're a high co-adherence person, so taking that in health therapy according to prescription, um, versus lower co-adherence um, people. Um, that between group difference is, is bang on. Something to say about year one is that this covered the period of COVID in the UK. We had shielding. So during this time, people were largely very cautious. There was less viral load, um, potentially less infections due to that viral load. So that was one thing that was going on. Um, and the other thing, obviously, is, is that was the sort of the first year period of time. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so it's just something to think about as we go into the year two results, <coughs> which are quite different. So in year two, what we saw was um, a divergence in these groups, where the, the high co-adherence group were continuing to improve with an, a positive annual um, FEV1 rate of change. Um, the lower co-adherence group dropping down and that between group difference being significant, uh, um, almost two and a half percent. And the next graph just really, um, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I look at numbers, I find it quite hard to kind of visualise well, what, what, what's that even look like? OK, are they diverging? I, I don't know. Um, so this graph, it's not how we would publish it, but it, it's just really to demonstrate for those of you who might like visual things like me. Um, on the left here, we've got our year one data. So each time on these graphs, it's starting from, from point zero of that year. Um, and what you can see on year one is that, yes, there is also a red stripe there. It's just absolutely overlaid with the blue stripe. So there is no difference between those groups. In year two, they're diverging off with our lower adherence group dropping off and our high adherence group continuing to improve. So I hope that's helpful for some people. <laughs> um, so um, I just want to mention, I suppose, um, as I bring the talk to a close, hopefully not horribly over time, that um, how much is enough, I think, is an important question here. And I just want to mention the Ivor Kafter Irish Registry study. I'm going to look back at Ivor Kafter again because it tells us a lot about stuff. Um, and what was interesting in this registry data is that in the different age groups with different levels of lung function, we see a different longer term effect up to three years with, um, with Ivor Kafter. Would you just mind going forward one? Thank you. So in our patients under 12 years, so people under 12 years with a very well preserved lung function, so minimal lung damage, uh, minimal lung involvement, um, we see that post Ivor Kafter, so where we can see on the right hand side of the graph, we're seeing this, this positive slope where there's a significant increase in FEV1 over that time. In our adolescent group, where you can see that that lung function is a bit lower, so we've gone from the 90 odd percent to the 85 percent, um, you can see that that slope is more steady, so the change is not significant. And then in our adults, the people that, that I predominantly see clinically, we've got a lower lung function. And actually, over that period of time, that three years with Ivor Kafter, the slope is dropping off. So um, I guess the question that I'm, I'm asking here, and it's not something that the data that we've got is answering yet, but it kind of is, um, is it that we need to work out how much is enough 
for individuals based on where they're at. Um, and by looking at all of the data together, sometimes that's a little bit tricky. So one of the things that we're, we're doing, um, if we move on, is Pluto, um, which is just a personalised data linkage to try and understand treatment optimization. And again, um, <laughs> and this is the framework. Um, so it's just starting to think about individuals and depending on what's happening when they come to clinic, um, really think about what could the thing for optimization be here. Um, and I want to thank Rob Sandler, who's a PhD student within um, CF Health Hub, who's working on this work, which, which will sort of be presented at some point as well. So we have, um, if, for example, if we take someone who's come through, FEV1 is decreasing, BMI is stable or increasing, we might think, well, BMI is stable or increasing, ETI is unlikely to be an issue, but we'll check the adherence. If it's satisfactory from NPR, we'll think about nebulizer adherence. If that's satisfactory, we can think about new pathology. If it's not satisfactory, we can think about the adherence support there. So this is just a way of coming back to that, how much is enough for each individual. So take home. Um, learning health systems really are enabling the outcomes of people with a wide late wide range of lung function to be understood and over time in a passive way this isn't anything where people are having to do something extra in order to deliver in order to share their data they have a passive method of data transfer for the electronic data um, and the rest of the data is largely from clinical or from registry data um, by year two of ETI, FEV1 trend is different between people with different levels of co-adherence to inhaled therapy. It is observational. NPR is not yet in the model. So there may be other things that are really special about this group. But um, as a start for 10, they are the higher adherence group. And um, people with high co-adherence to inhaled therapy at the moment are maintaining greater lung function benefits from ETI in the longer term at year two. But again, with the caveat that this is observational data without everything plugged into the model yet. So it does take a village. Um, there are a lot of people involved um, and um, I thank them all and thank the people with CF who are also involved. Um, just next slide. There's a QR code if you're interested. And I'd really like to thank the CF Foundation who um, support Nemo. Um, the CF Trust is where part of their clinical trials accelerator platform and NIHR as well. Um, and all of the organisations and people involved in that. And I would welcome any questions. Thank you. Please come to the mics. I'm, I'm sure many of you have questions for Tracy after this fantastic talk. Hi. Um, thank you. I'm Elaine. I'm from the UK. Thank you, Tracy, for a great talk and for the, um, the work that has gone into this. Um, I work in paediatrics, and I guess it's, it, is there a plan for Health Hub to be able to be available for that adolescent group? Because I think that's where we need to, to make the difference going forward. Thanks, Elaine. Um, so there's been a pilot study of CF Health Hub in paediatrics um, that happened at Southampton. Um, that's in the process of, of being ready for publication. Um, it, it's slightly more challenging in terms of, um, as I've said, the big ethos is the data belongs to the person and they choose to share it. That's a little bit more challenging when it comes to paediatrics. Also within CF Health Hub is embedded a, an intervention, habit formation based intervention. <clears throat> and that looks very different for paediatrics and adults. Um, so the short answer is yes, that is the intention, um, as always, finance allowing. Um, but the longer answer is that I think um, it, it does look different, a little bit different. And it, it's, um, yeah, look out for the paper. <laughs> Thanks, Elaine. <coughs> Alan Smith, uh, Nottingham. Tracy, thanks for a lovely presentation. Uh, just a couple of observations and a question. So I guess the first observation is that these data are in a subgroup of the digitally engaged. 
and not everybody is digitally engaged, particularly those who suffer socioeconomic disadvantage. So I'd just be a little bit cautious about extrapolating to a wider population. I suppose, secondly, my understanding, if I've got it right, is that you're measuring adherence to inhaled medications. And if you're non-adherent to those, you may well be non-adherent to other things, such as physiotherapy. So and it, it may help you classify, but it doesn't necessarily finger the mechanism of this, which therapy it is that you can do without. And I guess my third thing is a question, and it's about you've identified um, a non-adherent group. They're, they've been open about this. They're sharing their data with you. But is that a pretty robust phenotype? Is there a great deal you can do about changing them or, or co doing some co-decision making to move from a non-adherent to an adherent group? Thanks, Alan. Um, to address the first point, actually, which I know wasn't a question, but it really interests me about digital equity, digital inequity engagement. Um, one of the things that happened when CF Health Hub was, um, was starting the RCT is that the interventions come from quite a wide range of different professions. And at one of our sites um, was a social worker. Um, and actually, we saw a real difference. And um, I'm honest, I can't think that this has been published. But when we looked at who was coming into the programme, I think it was quite different depending on who was actually doing the, the recruitment into that study. Um, the other thing to mention is a lot of the recruitment happened within inpatients and our frequent flyer inpatients can look quite different in that way as well. So I absolutely hear what you're saying. Um, and I think there's, there's definitely some more thinking to do about how we ensure, because one of the concerns is if we use digital data and we get our most adherent in, we're human and we pay attention right to what we see. So we actually increase that, that problem, that gap. Um, so it's definitely something to think more about. Um, so that was that, was that point. Um, and then the actual question, sorry, can you repeat the last question? So, so if, if you're that. in the non-adherent phenotype, <laughs> yeah. um, would you wish to become more adherent? Yeah. And if so, how could you work in partnership yeah. with the patient to do that? So CF Health have published an RCT in Thorax, um, and that um, talked about the habit formation intervention. It was shown to be effective. So those who had the habit formation um, intervention improved their adherence significantly and maintained it. So I think there are ways of intervening. Um, I think that adherence is always complex, um, and there's a lot to do about choice and about um, kind of how we do that. But definitely we've proven that by using habit formation alongside electronic data, we can improve adherence. Uh, hi, Tracy. Really lovely talk. Thank you very much. Um, my name's Kevin. I'm co-chief investigator with Gwyneth, who's uh, sat here uh, on CS Storm. And, uh, and, and uh, your group, CF DigiCare, have helped us with collecting some adherence paper uh, data on some of the patients in our study and we're very grateful for that and that's one of the great things about working in this arena we've worked with Nicole and David and we're sort of all trying to push together to get more uh, evidence for our patients um, and I guess everybody in this room we're kind of pushing against an open door we're, we all want more evidence this is this is why you've all turned up this morning um, but I just wanted to make a comment really um, around some of the, the statements that were made earlier on and I do appreciate it and you say oh well all, all my patients have decided to stop any anyway um, I know a lot of people are saying that quite glibly and I think that's really something that we need to be very careful about and you know your high adherers are amazing and what they do on a day-to-day -day basis is is phenomenal and and we need to appreciate that and we need to appreciate also that they're not disinterested in stopping those therapies. They're really actually quite keen to know, but they want to know the evidence. And I think what's happened here, we need to reflect on as a community over the last, well, since Ivor Kafta, but more acutely since ETI, is families have been coming to us and, and asking us for our advice. And I, I'm not completely sure, well, I know that I, I don't think that advice has always been 
Um, so so if, 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 if somebody comes to us and says, look, you know, I thought about this long and hard, I'm just going to stop the Dornay's Alpha because um, I've got better things to do in my life. And, and you have to respect that and you have to work with them. But if somebody comes to you and says, what should I do? How should I go forward? You, what we should be saying is we don't have the evidence yet, but we'll try and get the evidence. I don't think that has happened. And I think it's really something that as a community we should reflect on. So that wasn't a question, sorry, Tracy. Uh, that was just a ramble, but. No, I think they're really, really good points. Um, I guess, you know, I, I completely see where you're coming from there, absolutely. And I think it is really, really important that we get this data. I guess the Simplify Low Lung Function Study did demonstrate the difficulty in recruitment. And um, I don't think at ECFS, um, Alex, you sort of said exactly why. Um, but I guess one of the concerns can be that people, some people do seem to have made the choice. But maybe what would be interesting is knowing more from Simplify about their thoughts um, and hopefully we'll see that in the paper about why that study was quite difficult to recruit to. Um, yeah, um, I'm, I'm wondering if I'm going to hear another British voice. <laughs> no, not, no, not this time, but I, I, it was three in a row. Uh, so uh, this is Craig Lapman. I'm from Connecticut Children's. And I was just wondering, you know, as one of the other comments that we made earlier is that, you know, people go ahead and stop their therapy, but then will go ahead and re and then start it again uh, when they're sick. So I'm, uh, does, will you be able to capture that with your data? So, you know, are the low, it, uh, you could certainly presume that some of the low adherence folks would go ahead and say, I'm going to go ahead and be, you know, I'll start it up when I'm sick. Will you be able to go ahead and do some data analysis on answering that question later? Yeah, absolutely. So all of the data is time stamped. Um, so we can look at those patterns. And, you know, that low lung function group, as we showed on the graph, they were, you know, from the 30% moving down to the 20%. And um, that that is very broad data, but we will be able to look further down at what those patterns of treatment taking are. And I agree, I think it's fascinating. There's been a few conversations actually with people involved in, in this arena, in research in this arena. And I think we're all really interested in that more PRN use and what that looks like and what that does. So I think this is the joy of electronic data capture. I'm, you know, a big advocate for it. I know it has its challenges, but actually when we use it in partnership with people, it gives us a level of data that... Um, goes far and beyond anything else that we can get. We we just have have that there to really understand true patterns. Um, and clinically, I love it. You know, you, you sort of, when someone wants to share that data with you, you're sort of like, okay, so your pattern is two o'clock in the morning to do this. You know, how does that work? And you're missing it on this day. What happens there? Uh, that's because of, you know, so actually working it through with people is fascinating um and, and i think it opens a real opportunity to have great conversations with people about what their data looks like yeah be, be, again and i think it's important it's going to be really important because it is another question that we you know when we're making that recommendation or with that assumption uh, you know our own bias or not is that you know, doing that PRN, these a lot of these medications were developed to be chronic therapies and going ahead and going, just using it for an exacerbation, it may not be adding much benefit and doing exactly the same as, as you know, where we're, where, where we're stuck at. So I think it's going to be very, uh, it's a good question to add in yeah. and, and try and see what the results are. We're going yeah. a little bit over time. We had some good questions in the in the Q&A as well, and I'm just gonna try to lump them all into one, even though we're quite a bit over, is about clusters of adherence, muco act, mucolytics versus inhaled antibiotics and adherence to modulators. So, and I think those are good questions to ask, and I don't know if there's a simple way to put it into <laughs> a short sentence so we can move on. <laughs> I say, um, <clears throat> adherence to modulators, I think, is really important. It may well be the thing, other thing that is special about our high adherence group. So I'm really excited for when we get the final data cleaning of that done. It's been quite complicated, um, as has the adherence data. But getting that done and plugging that into the model will be really fascinating. So I hope that addresses modulators. Um, in terms of mucolytics, one limitation of EDC at the moment, um, or certainly 
certainly the one that we use and all the ones that I'm aware of is that we can't necessarily know which medication is being taken. Um, if anyone has nose technology to do that, that would be amazing. But at the moment, we can't. Um, so picking out some of that granularity is really challenging. We have done some work with diaries with people, but it's unlikely to be largely included. This will be more in health therapy as a whole or not kind of um, information. Thank you. Thank you, exactly. Tracy. Thank you so much, and thank you to David. <laughs> All right, so next up, our following speaker is Jill Maggs. She is a member of the STRC and Quest Working Group uh, and is also a parent of a child with CF. And she's going to be speaking to us. Uh, her talk is entitled Changing the Conversation, Exploring the Influence of Participation in a Withdrawal Study on Clinical Communication. And hopefully, she will be able to do her own slides. <laughs> Wait, just, I got you. Oh, okay. um, while David's doing that, I would like to say, <laughs> please don't be confused by the accent. Um, I am going to be talking about the American Simplify and Quest studies, but great to hear some voices from home. I, I've lived here over 20 years, but haven't lost my accent. Should um, be able to click, then you'd be good. Click on that one. OK. It is really bright up here. It is um, I have nothing to declare. It's a bit like going through customs. <laughs> there we go. Um, May you live in a time of change is an ancient Chinese curse. Change is acknowledged as a, a curse because it's inherently stressful. But I think that as members of the, the CF community, we're seeing this as an exciting opportunity. And the stress of change is really far outweighed by hope and optimism for a better future. It seems important, therefore, to have a better understanding about how recent experiences um, influence clinical conversations, how people with CF view these changes, and what they feel are important elements within such conversations. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay, hopefully I'll get it. Um, so I'm not going to re reiterate anything about the the simplified trial, um, other than to say that as one of the first withdrawal studies um, in CF, it's, it was a very novel concept. And so it was important, um, or seems important, to understand the actual experience of taking part in, in such a study. Hence, Quest, the qualitative understanding of the experience of the simplified trial aim to do just that. Um, as a qualitative study, it was huge. Um, we interviewed over 100 people who would participated um, in Simplify. We interviewed them twice. Um, so as I say, just so much data um, to try and make sense of. But the initial readings of the interview transcripts led us to identify um, four sort of high-level ar areas of interest. The research experience, which we presented at um, last year's conference, uh, and there is a manuscript in preparation, um, changing concepts about the burden of healthcare, and um, there is a poster if anyone wants to go and have a look at it after this, um, and how, how notions about health status are also changing. And the influ influence of taking part in a withdrawal study um, on talking with your healthcare team after you've been in the study. Yay, I did it. Um, as you can see from this slide, we were able to recruit um, a very representative sample of um, people who'd been in Simplify. Um, gender was evenly distributed, and each of the age groups had representation. 
Um, interviewing people of 14 requires a rather different skill set from talking to people in their 60s. Um, but we, our, our interviewers did a really get great job. And we had so much really rich data from, from so many individuals. Um, we also had balanced representation of the maintain medication versus stop medication from Simplify and also whether it was hypertonic saline or um, Dornay's Alpha. One of the important things to remember is that these interviews took place before the findings of Simplify were shared at last year's meeting. So, what did we do with all this data? This short list of tasks doesn't really convey the hours of reading and reflection that went into the analysis of the transcripts, into developing codes, applying the codes to each transcript, and then analyzing what was um, within those coded data. For those of you not familiar with qualitative methodology, in effect, this is a, a sorting exercise that tries to see patterns and commonalities in what people are saying, each in their own individual way, with their own unique framework of reference and context. It, it is, as I said, very time consuming. But once we had come to a shared understanding of what the umbrella theme was, the pieces really did fall into place. I'm not going to sing. Don't worry. <laughs> I hope, though, that you'll end up with a little earworm of, of uh, Aretha Franklin's song um, as a, an aid memoir. Um, respect was a clear overall theme within the data. Participants really did make it clear how much they respected their care providers. So kudos to all of you who, who fulfill that role. There was the odd exception, which really proved how important it was that, that people respect their, their care teams. But it was also very apparent that um, participants appreciated feeling respected as an autonomous person too. And as we thought about the language the participants used in talking to us about their post-simplify conversations with their care providers, it became apparent that R-E-S-P-E-C-T works as an acronym too. Reciprocity, the R. Any conversation is a process of exchange. This is very different from taking a clinical history, but the give and take of information and opinion. The participants wanted to feel seen and understood as people during these conversations. And one of the um, caregivers felt that um, being in, in Simplify had been a great experience for her daughter because it had given her the opportunity um, to actually get to know her care team more as people rather than people in white coats and also for them to begin to see her daughter as the emerging adult that, sh that she is. And that was leading to far better conversations in clinic. Um, the abbreviations on this slide, um, HS was hypertonic saline, Dornay's alpha, um, DA, and whether they were in the continue or discontinue arm of the study. Um, that second quote, kind of shows how important um, having that reciprocity um, is. That person was obviously not feeling seen. Oh, skipped one. How do I go back? Oh, no, sorry. No, it's OK. I'm looking at the wrong bit of the screen. Um, being in Simplify made having conversations about stopping or decreasing treatments much easier. Um, interestingly, these types of comments came from, from people who were in the maintain arm of Simplify, as well as from those who were in the 
discontinue um, medications part of the study. Both of the quotes here are actually from people who uh, continued their medications throughout the, their participation in Simplify. So for them, it wasn't that they had stopped as part of the trial and felt safe and didn't have any adverse effects from stopping, but the fact that such a study actually was carried out. Um, participants also talked about extending this conversation to other medications and treatments, questioning the current value and benefit of many aspects of their, their treatment regimens. We could have also said that sim the Simplify experience was empowering, um, enabling opening up of these types of conversations in clinic. Thank you. <laughs> so, as, as we've heard, following participation in Simplify, several participants didn't actually return to using either Dornay's Alpha or hypertonic saline with any regularity. And it was apparent that some care providers were more comfortable with this situation than others. Um, as I said, this was before the Simplify findings had um, been shared. But some of the participants felt apprehensive about explaining how well they felt not taking um, hypertonic saline or Dornay's, and they were concerned that they, their experiences wouldn't be um, believed. Being able to safely discontinue a routine medication has an impact on how people think um, about living with CF and impacting perception of burden of care and perceptions about health status. Overall, the participants wanted care providers to listen to what they were saying about their experiences and to believe them, being aware of the um, sense, being sensitive to the challenges of living with CF. So partnership. In making decisions to continue or, or stop medications, participants really wanted um, to work with their care teams to evaluate what was safe for them, where the margins of error are. Um, and they wanted to work with their care providers to find solutions that were helpful to them as individuals, that acknowledged their preferences and fit with their, their lifestyle. Um, I guess if you're doing your treatment at 2 a.m., <laughs> you have a, an interesting lifestyle. But um, the second quote was actually from somebody um, who disliked using a vest. It wasn't a rebellious teenager, um, but she had always been told that um, this was what you need to do until um, this physician came along and said, I, I hear you, let's work together to find other ways um, to keep you, you healthy. Um, all these elements of, of communication are, of course, linked. And we could have used this first quote in reciprocity, um, that exchange of, of information and opinion. Um, and that last sentence in that first quote, we could have used um, to illustrate the next point which is about expertise. Um, the participants talked about how much they, how, how they hold their, their care teams in high esteem, how they recognize them as experts, but they also wanted to be recognized as experts in their own lives. Um, the first quote um, shows a participant who feels that they know their body and the way it reacts better than the health team, the care team. Participants talked about valuing their health and how their body feels and not wanting to jeopardize any feeling of wellness and the progress that they've made since starting um, ETI. They want to be safe, but also because managing CF treatment is an effort, they want to strive for a more normal life uh, and a better CF care life balance. 
there was a desire that their experience and knowledge about how to live with CF is taken into account. Um, I think the, the second quote um, illustrates the respect that um, this particular participant and others um, have for their care teams and perhaps shows a more passive um, recognition of, of the doctor as expert. Although sometimes expressing frustration at care teams caution, um, many um, participants were very understanding of the dilemma that care teams face when making suggestions about future treatment and, and management. And I think that speaks to some of the, the converse, um, questions that um, Tracy w was asked. Um, the, they understood that in this new era of ETI, no one yet knows what treatments can be decreased or stopped safely. And the issue of safety was understood to be very important. And it was clear that participants felt that in being cautious, their physicians, their care teams had their best interests in mind. We chose the word caution because that's what the participants used themselves. But perhaps um, another word that we could have used here was consideration with its implications of thoughtfulness, of weighing evidence, and not coming to an automatic or well-rehearsed response. Transparency. Um, being open and honest is so important um, in clinical conversations. It has links to reciprocity, that give and take of an honest exchange of views. Um, Honesty is fostered in a, a non-judgmental um, relationship and participants made it clear that they were more likely to be honest about adherence if they felt that they would be helped rather than judged. Um, as with the element of caution, participants were clear that they don't expect care teams to have all the answers, but they really want to understand why recommendations are being made and what the rationale um, is. An aspect of the Quest study that really impressed me is how well informed and sophisticated um, people with CF are about clinical research and the role that evidence-based practice pay, plays in their day-to-day -day management of CF. Um, so while it, it, it may take a little time, it has links to being the expert um, and working in partnership with people with CF to ensure that um, they have the best care for them as an individual. So, um, in conclusion, although our analysis about clinical conversations post Simplify was with a focus of the influence of that study on talking about decreasing or discontinuing uh, medications, and we developed the acronym RESPECT in that context, um, we hope that it will have wider application too, that clinical conversations should be open and honest, participants should feel empowered to engage in discussion and decision making. Um, Partnership, I know, is, is important to um, everyone here um, and is recognised within the STRC um, initiative. Um, PEP? Again, losing my acronyms here. Um, and that, that people with CF actually really do understand why you're cautious sometimes, um, even though it's sometimes frustrating. Um, and, and, and that there is a level of sophistication um, to, to these conversations. I would like to show my respect um, to the rest of the team who helped prepare um, this presentation, Michelle, um, Liam and Austin, and to the wider um, Quest team 
Um, I've really enjoyed working with you and thank you for the opportunity. Trying to see questions from anyone in the audience. You can really not see. Or in the chat. I didn't see. From my standpoint, I just think that this is a great talk to be sort of our sandwich in the middle because it really centers the the patient and the person living with CF and their families at the center of what we do. We're on one side. We're talking about a lot of quantitative data, but this qualitative data really sort of shows that we as a community have a lot of trust. And I've heard about. We also have to be trustworthy. So trust and trustworthiness is really important in what we do, and this really um, brings that home for me. So thank you for this work. Okay. I'm going to get off lightly. <laughs> thank you. All right, next up we have Sharon Sutton. She is a pharmacist who will be speaking to us about measuring adherence to chronic therapies over two years of treatment with ETI in people with CF, and specifically the RECOVER study. Hopefully I'll be able to see this. You got it. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present today. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, so today I'm going to talk about measuring adherence to chronic therapies over two years of treatment with ETI in people with CF, um, the RECOVER study. Oh. Now here we go. <laughs> I have it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I have nothing to disclose. So what is the RECOVER study? Um, so we really needed an acronym because it's quite long. So it's the real world clinical outcomes with novel modulator therapy combinations in people with CF. Recover. Um, so recruitment began when um, ETI was licensed in Europe in 2020. There's two arms to the study, Recover 12 Plus and Recover 6 to 11. So Recover 12 Plus is adults and children over 12 years and Recover 6 to 11 is uh, children 6 to 11 years. So recruitment for both of these studies uh, began when ETI was licensed for that age group. Um, and today I'm mainly going to talk about the results for the Recover 12 Plus. It's a multi-centre cohort study across the UK and Ireland, and it's based in seven paediatric and adult sites. And we follow each participant over a two-year period. This is just a graphic um, just to bring up where the sites are located. So as you can see, we've got four sites in Dublin, so both adult and paediatric. We have adult and paediatric in Limerick. We have an adult or a paediatric site in Belfast, and both adult and paediatric in uh, London in the Brompton. So these, uh, the first five are the main recovery study outcome measures, but today I'm going to focus on the adherence to treatment as I am the lead on this subsection. So as you've heard in the talks previously, uh, measuring adherence is extremely complex. We use three methods to measure adherence um, as we wanted to try and get a better overview and to try and triangulate the data. So the first method was medication possession ratio, and we calculated this from dispense reports. Um, we also used self-report questionnaires, um, and we utilised these from one of our collaborators, Dr. Alexander Quitner. We also used a direct measure, which was electronic monitoring systems, which are MEMS gaps. So just to briefly touch upon each of these methods, so the medication possession ratio. So we calculated MPUR at yearly time points, so minus one to zero was baseline. So going forward in my tables, you will see that that's referred to as baseline. Zero to one is 12 months and one to two is 24 months. Um, so we looked at this data. So we calculated MPUR for 12 months prior to starting ETI and for all of the concomitant meds and for the 24 months post starting ETI. Uh, we also calculated antimicrobial courses, but I won't be uh, discussing that information today. For the self-report questionnaires, uh, we use the disease-specific validated tool, um, which is validated for children and adults over 12 years. And as I said, it was adapted from one of our collaborators, Dr. Alexandra Quitner. So we went from a paper-based format at the beginning of the study to an electronic format. 
We collect this data at three monthly intervals for, from baseline for the uh, 24 months. And then finally, the direct measure. So we use the gold standard for measuring adherence. So this was the MEMS caps. So they're computer chipped medication lids. They record every time the medication bottle is opened. So we decanted the medication. So we use these only for ETI and Ivacafter. We decanted the medication down from their original packaging into a medication bottle for the morning and a medication bottle for the evening time. We only use this in a subset of participants due to the high cost, um, so only the Dublin sites. Um, and we needed uh, to heavily rely on our community pharmacy colleagues to decant the medication for the participants. They did collect their medication monthly, the same as they always would have from their community pharmacy. Recruitment for this study was extremely challenging, and I'll explain that later on. So the results, as I mentioned, I'm only going to discuss the results of the Recover 12 Plus today. That study is now completed. So for medication possession ratio, um, I'll orientate you across this table. I have a few tables um, over the next few slides. So this is cross-sectional analysis at the end of the 24 months. Just to highlight a few key things. So for modulators, as you can see here, oh, sorry, I thought my arrow would work. Um, so the medications are listed on the left-hand side of the screen. And then we're looking at baseline 12 months and 24 month data. And we're looking at the mean percentage adherence. The asterisks highlight where there is a significant difference between baseline and 12 months and 12 to 24 months. As you can see here at baseline, so these were the patients that had been on modulators prior to ETI being licensed for the previous 12 months. Um, mean adherence was 84.5%. Then at the 12 month mark, as you can imagine, um, as we expected, there would be a rise in uh, percent, mean percentage adherence, and that increased with significance to 92.6%. But interestingly enough, after the 24 months, from 12 to 24 months, there was a reduction in ETI adherence, and that went down to 81.2%. Obviously, this is still good adherence, but it does showcase that there was a reduction after the 24 months. And then to highlight just two other key things, for Dornase Alpha and hypertonic saline, which we've heard a lot of talk about today in the previous studies, for Dornase Alpha, there was a significant reduction from baseline to 12 months. Um, so it went from 74.1% down to 60%, and then a further reduction at 24 months down to 49.2%. And then for hypertonic saline, although there was a trend over the 24 months in reducing, uh, there was only statistical significance seen at the 12 month mark, where it reduced from 69.3% down to 51 or 58.1%. This next table, we wanted to look at uh, the data more granularly, and we wanted to see um, pairs. So the number of participants that were on the treatment time type at baseline 12 and 24 months, and if there was any difference across this cohort. As you can see, for these specific patients, there was, a, um, for the modulators in particular, their mean percentage adherence was quite high. Um, you can see that the mean percentage adherence baseline was 90.6%, and then after 12 months, it increased with significance to 98.5%. Just to point out again for Dornase Alpha and hypertonic saline, from baseline to 24 months, we did see a decrease in percentage adherence as well, similar to the previous table, which was the cross-sectional ana analysis. Um, and it, the, final the final mean percentage for Dornase Alpha was 57.6%, and then for hypertonic saline was 55.5%. We then looked at the self-report data, and there was nothing significant to report here with the self-report data. The one thing to highlight was that you can see that it overestimates adherence compared to NPR <laughs> greatly. Um, but there was nothing significant between, between the time points. We also then wanted to compare the self-report data versus the NPR at each time point, so baseline 12 and 24 months. And as you can see here, for modulators, Dornase Alpha, hypertonic saline, and pancreatic enzymes at all three time points, there was a significant difference between what was reported in self-report versus NPR. 
Um, and the highest difference um, was with the pancreatic enzymes, with an average of 30% difference between what was reported taking um, and what they picked up from their pharmacies. We did some further modelling um, on this, and I know the, the graphics are quite difficult to see, um, but I'll talk you through them anyway. So we broke down the data into good adherers versus poor adherers. So the good adherents uh, we used was anything over 80%, and the poor adherence was anything under 80%. And we looked at it, um, so the clinical, the outcome measures we looked at were FEV1, sweat chloride, lung clearance index, and the abdominal pain score from the abdominal symptom questionnaire. And we looked at these for hypertonic saline, Dornase alpha modulators, and pancreatic enzymes. And across the 24 months of the study, there was no significant difference between the groups. But there were two interesting findings that in the 12 months prior to ETI initiation for Dornase alpha, the um, good adherers had a significantly higher FEV1 to those that were poor, poor adherers. Um, and similar trend was seen with the pancreatic enzymes. Those that were better adherers to pancreatic enzymes had a lower pain score in the abdominal symptom questionnaire in the 12 months prior to ETI initiation. So other relevant findings were that uh, we looked at correlation analysis for um, associations between MPR and BMI. And it did show that those that had a higher adherence to insulin and uh, nutritional supplements had a higher BMI. And we also broke down the data to adolescents versus adults. And we wanted to see if there was any difference between the age groups. And there was no significant difference between the adherence in the reported in the adults versus the adolescents. So the MEM study, which I briefly touched upon earlier, um, I did report this data last year, and we did only follow these participants for the first 12 months of the study. Initial recruitment was quite high, so we started with about 30 participants, but we actually only finished the 12 months with seven. So retention on this study was extremely difficult. We recognised that there was going to be a high dropout rate pretty early, and we applied for ethical approval for um, a withdrawal feedback form. And these were some of the reasons that the participants gave to us for uh, withdrawing from the study. So 50% found it harder to track their medication, 43% found it harder to remember to take their medication, and 36% felt like they were more likely to skip their medication. Of the seven participants that remained at the 12 months, the overall um, percentage adherence was 82.9%. So again, that was lower than what was reported in MPR and the self-report. We wanted to be proactive about this as we recognised that this device was not suitable for this cohort of patients. So we applied for an innovation grant, which we were awarded, and we wanted to develop a medication adherence technology for patients using blister packed medications, so not decanting from the original packaging. We are currently uh, doing focus groups um, and we have done a few to date um, and we want to develop something that's accurate and non-invasive that can use the blister pack medication. And we want to work closely with the CF community to develop this, so something by the patient for the patient. So I'm just going to briefly touch upon this from the Recover 6 Plus study. So as I mentioned earlier, the validated tool that we used uh, from one of our collaborators, Dr. Alexander Quitner, so that was the treatment adherence questionnaire. We also used the adherence barrier questionnaire, but these were only validated in children and adults over 12 years. And we do have a cohort of patients that are 6 to 11. So we needed to develop something that was suitable for that cohort. So we collaborated um, with the originator, with Alex Dr. Alexander Quitner as part of the team to try and develop something that was suitable for this cohort. So we performed cognitive interviews on four participants uh, that were six to 11 years. These results, from these results, we used them to revise the measures and we developed a much shorter questionnaire. So we merged the treatment adherence questionnaire and the adherence barrier questionnaire. We changed the language, we added in a lot of graphics and it's all electronic. This was then assessed by a panel of experts. So two physios, two psychologists, and two nurses. 
We then performed test retest reliability on it and there was no significant difference between time one and time two with suggested stability over time. So we gave the questionnaire on uh, day one, so baseline, and then we got them to redo the questionnaire um, for 10 to 14 days after. Um, this questionnaire is now being used as part of the Recover 6 to 11 study, and we have um, over 80 participants have used it to date, and we collect that data at three monthly intervals. So just a summary of the Recover 12 plus information. So for MPR, we did show, we did see that adherence to ETI at 12 months was 92.6%, but it reduced with significance at the 24 month mark to 81.2%. MPR based on data to 12 months and then 12 to 24 months for Dornase Alpha reduced with significance. And for hypertonic saline, there was only a significant reduction seen at 12 months, but it did further reduce at the 24 month mark. TAC overestimates adherence compared to MPR. And the MEM study, um, technically it was challenging and we only had low numbers in the study. We would like to perform a lot of further analysis on this data. So one of the things that we would really like to do is look at the model the modeling um, for a continuous data set rather than breaking it down into the good versus poor adherers. I'd like to thank all of our study participants and parents for their time, dedication and enthusiasm and the whole Recover study collaborators and staff at our clinical sites and also the funders, the CF uh, Trust, uh, Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and CF Ireland. Thank you very much. Well, welcome people to come up for questions. Um, I do have a, one question and I don't see any inhaled antibiotics. Why were inhaled antibiotics not looked at in the study? They are looked at. We actually we do have that information. We only just picked a few a few treatment types uh, to discuss here today. But in the paper, we will have all the information. <laughs> yeah, awesome talk. I love that you decant medications in Ireland. Uh, <laughs> uh, but a question from the audience: Did you collect, or is there a mechanism to collect reasons for lower adherence? Um, so we do have the adherence barrier questionnaire and we do have all that data um, we just have to assess it for the 24 months. So that would give us an idea as to the barriers to why people aren't adhering. Hi, I'm from Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin. Thank you for uh, your talk. It's great. I have wondered when it comes to NPR and I'm not sure how every different site calculates it, but I know that there's a specific formula, but particularly related to the enzymes, I've noticed that how a prescription order is written and the intention of that dosing matters quite a bit in calculating the MPR. And I think our intention as a group as a whole um, is to provide patients with enough enzyme to get them through what they need to get through in their lives and days. But at the same time, I wonder if we um, shoot ourselves and particularly the NPR in the foot, so to speak, by overestimating and overcalculating the need of uh, doses and quantity in a month, and therefore the patient doesn't necessarily need to renew it uh, as often, and therefore their NPR goes down too. So I wonder sometimes, I wonder a lot about writing the prescription order the way we actually want the patient to take it, discuss it as uh, clinicians, and then um, why, why that is, um, not just clinically, but also from an adherence standpoint. And I wanted to know what you thought about that. Yeah, so measuring uh, enzymes is extremely complex. So what we came up with was that we would ask the participants at the three monthly, so we have a prescribed treatment plan that we discuss with the participants, um, and they tell us an average uh, that they take daily and from that we calculate then based on what they collect from their pharmacies. There is no method for measuring adherence that is not without its flaws, but it's the best that we had. Nicole Hamblett, University of Washington. That was an excellent uh, presentation. And um, I was just wondering, as you consider refining the adherence uh, collection methods, particularly in relation to the MEM study, um, obviously it looked like the adherence tracking itself may have an impact on adherence. Um, and in particular, you know, uh, how we consider the ethics of, 
of that <laughs> yep. with respect to ETI and how we could monitor that in particular for safety, you know, going forward as well for future studies. So I think that was one of the major findings of this study was that the MEMS caps was not suitable for this cohort of patients at all. Um, and that the blister pack medication that uh, the, me the medication comes in is, is really relevant and really useful packaging. Um, and that is why we're using these workshops to try and learn from the patients and get a better insight into what they want and what they will allow in their home and how best we can measure adherence in this real world setting using the original packaging and not decanting it. So it's definitely at the forefront um, and that's we're trying to be proactive and come up with something more suitable. Thank you so much, Sharon. Thank great. you. Thank you. All right, so our finer, final speaker, speaker today is Dr. Georgian Hergenroder, who is a assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Pulmonary and Sleep Medicine at CHOP in Philadelphia. And she will be talking to us today about clinical features associated with changes in chronic daily therapies in people with CF taking ETI, specifically the HERO study. All righty. Well, thank you so much, Drs. Brown and Miller, for the opportunity to speak. And I'm excited to share with you all about some initial preliminary findings from the home reported outcomes in CF or HERO2 study, and would also like to say hello to participants online as well. I have no disclosures relevant to this talk. As my co-presenters have already highlighted for you all, chronic daily therapies are a significant burden for people with CF and the remarkable improvements in lung function with ETI raise this question of, is there opportunity to reduce chronic daily therapies? So what do we know about how people's practices have changed so far? Well, we just heard from Dr. Sutton about how things have changed in Ireland, as well as the ongoing work in the UK with the NEMO study. Um, there were a few other retrospective cohort studies that I, make, I came across in my literature review, um, one out of Greece and one out of Canada, um, looking at adults ranging between 15 and, and about 70 participants, which did show a reduction in inhaled therapies um, based on medication possession ratios. Um, and then, of course, um, no need to recapitulate the wonderful ongoing work um, from the randomized control trial perspective. Dr. Mayor Hamblett just reviewed the Simplify updates. And then there's the ongoing work by our colleagues in the UK with the CF Storm study. So many people looking at these questions from different perspectives. And so I'd like to share a bit about what we're doing with the HERO2 study. So it's a 12-month prospective observational real-world research cohort study in which we included participants age 12 and above on or about to start ETI. And participants had the opportunity to track their symptoms and their medication usage for an entire year. All consent and data collection occurred through the Folia app, so remotely, um, and the Folia Health app is a cloud-based smartphone application that allows people the opportunity to track their own symptoms and medication usage. Participants also provided consent for their data to be linked with the CF Foundation's patient registry. <coughs> At enrollment, we requested participants fill out a baseline survey asking whether they had made changes in their chronic daily therapies, and if so, what did they change? And that data is what I'm going to be sharing with you all today. And overall, our goal with this study is really to take the opportunity to study these changes in chronic daily therapy usage and discontinuation practices in a large, diverse cohort of people with CF taking ETI. So in total, we included 860 participants in this study. We were able to link 91% of those participants with the CF patient registry, and 87% of participants completed this baseline enrollment survey. 
So what did we find? Well, at baseline, about 42% of participants reported discontinuing at least one chronic daily therapy. What were those therapies? Well, the majority of people who discontinued something discontinued airway clearance therapy. The next most common was Dornase Alpha, and you can see stepwise from there. These numbers don't add up to 100% though, because some people discontinued more than one therapy. And so that's what I highlight on the figure on the left, is that among those 42% of people, some people just stopped one, but there were certainly a, a large proportion of people who stopped more than one therapy. Here I show the demographics of all study participants, as well as those in the middle column who did not discontinue a chronic daily therapy, and then the um, column on the right, those who discontinued at least one therapy. And first I'd like to point out that in our cohort, we did have a predominance of female sex, um, white and non-Hispanic. When we look at the characteristics of people comparing those who did and did not discontinue therapies, we didn't find a difference in terms of age, sex, race, or ethnicity with these initial descriptive statistics. But what we did see is when we look at insurance status, a higher proportion of people with private insurance discontinued a chronic daily therapy. We didn't see a difference in our descriptive statistics for um, genotype or for prior modulator use. And then when we looked at parameters of lung health, looking at the overall means for FEV1, there wasn't a difference between the two groups. However, once we stratified participants into degree of obstructive lung disease, we found that among those who did not discontinue a chronic daily therapy, there were a higher proportion of people who had severe obstructive lung disease with an FEV1 of less than 40% of predicted. We also found that there were a higher proportion of people in the group that didn't discontinue therapies who had had a pulmonary exacerbation in the prior year. We then performed logistic regression, evaluating the characteristics associated with odds of CDT discontinuation. Looking at the unadjusted model, we saw similar trends as I showed you on the prior table where insurance status was associated with CDT discontinuation. You see the um, having public insurance associated with lower odds. Um, and in addition, lower odds among those who had had uh, pulmonary exacerbation in the prior year. However, once we adjusted for the other variables in the model, those relationships no longer were significant. And what we're seeing in the adjusted comparison is that older age was associated with higher odds of CDT discontinuation. We also found that as compared to those who were heterozygous for f 508 del those who were homozygous or had other genotypes were less likely to discontinue CDTs, as were people who were on prior non-ETI modulators. And I will point out that those um, two variables, the genotype and modulator use, may be collinear, particularly recognizing that most people on not prior um, non-ETI modulators had to be homozygous um, to be on those. All right, so I'd like to summarize for you all the data I've presented so far. So firstly, stopping chronic daily therapies is really common among people with CF on ETI, where even at our baseline enrollment, 42% of people reported stopping at least one thing. And so I think this is a signal for all of us to continue to partner with our patients with CF and their families to have this open dialogue and shared decision making about how best to approach de-escalation of care. We found that CDT discontinuation at enrollment was associated with private health insurance and better lung function. Um, however, in our logistic regression model, the adjusted model, we found that those relationships were no longer significant, but we did find higher odds of CDT discontinuation among those who uh, of increasing age, as well as an association with prior modulator use and having homozygous f 508 del genotype or other genotype as compared to heterozygous being associated with lower odds of CDT discontinuation. 
I would like to call out that we just linked our folio data with the uh, 2022 patient registry a month ago. So some of our analysis is still ongoing. Um, the analysis I showed you so far is a limited set of variables, and there's more that we intend to look at. For example, parameters of nutritional status, um, the presence of CF-related diabetes, microbiology status, and even center effects. So there's, there's more to come here. We were also unable to determine, firstly, the duration of chronic daily therapy discontinuation. So when in relation to when ETI was started, were these therapies discontinued? And we were also unable to determine the reason for discontinuation as well. In terms of generalizability, as I noted before, our cohort was predominantly female, white, and non-Hispanic, so unable to generalize to the entire CF community. Um, and in addition, in order to be a part of the study, um, there was the need to be English speaking to use the app and of course to have access to technology, which was mentioned by one of the um, question askers earlier. Um, so in terms of next steps, We'd like to do a more comprehensive multivariable analysis. And then, of course, this is, again, just the baseline enrollment survey data. So we have a wealth of data that's going to be coming in over the next year, looking at these longitudinal changes in chronic daily therapies over a 12-month period. So there's much more to come here. One of the things that we're looking forward to evaluating are the patterns of use stratified by the type of chronic daily therapy. And hopefully, we'll be able to have those results to share with you all this time next year. And then, of course, there's the opportunity to contextualize our findings and integrate them with parallel studies going on in other countries. And then, of course, um, uh, CF Storm and Simplify looking from a randomized control trial perspective. Um, so um, wonderful to be a part of this group of many excellent researchers who are looking at this question of de-escalation of care from so many different perspectives to give our, our um, patients the, the most information possible for them to make their decisions. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who participated in the HERO2 study, primarily the people with CF, their families, and then um, our colleagues at various CF sites and coordinators who helped, and then particularly wanted to recognize that we had a HERO2 community member project team, which included people with CF and family members who helped um, with this study, and then of course my co-investigators. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Questions in the audience? Looks like no. Yeah, we don't have to, do not appear to have anything um, in the app. So when you were talking about, since I know this, but <laughs> I'm going to ask questions about my own study. Um, when we, you know, obviously we've kind of finished enrollment, but what what's the delay? Why can't we have the answers now? on all these patients? Great question. So we need to wait for the 2023 CFF patient registry data, which of course we won't get until fall of 2024. Um, yes, so that's kind of the, the big delay there. There's essentially kind of a one year lag for the data. All right. All right. Thanks to everyone. This was.